You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Do you have a downside target for the Dow or the S&P 500? Uh, about 15,000 on the Dow. And, and I think at that point, you have, um, you know, you've given up roughly, roughly 50%. You know, that's, that's not an uncommon uh, marker on the downside. I'm Bill Powers, and this is Mining Stock Education. Thank you for tuning in to another episode, and welcome back. Well, we are touching base today with a returning guest, uh, Mr. David McIlvaney. He's the CEO of the McIlvaney Financial Group, and we had David on the show about six months ago. And uh, many of you, I would guess, uh, listen to his weekly podcast as well, which provides an excellent rundown of what's going on in the financial realm and the precious metals sector. David has over 20 years of involvement in the wealth management industry. So David, welcome back onto Mining Stock Education. And when you're speaking Speaking with your wealth management clients, uh, what type of advice are you giving them due to this current economic situation we're in? You know, I think we're in a pretty good position uh, coming into this. We have maintained between 40 and 60 percent cash allocations. So the volatility that we've seen in the stock market um, has not had a huge effect on us. And in fact, um, we would look to put a lot of that money to work, um, assuming we, we see some lower prices in equities, which we do think we will have. Um, so that's the main thing that we've asked uh, clients to kind of hold out for is, is better pricing. Um, we are just getting into the earnings season, and we'll get to hear not only the impact from COVID on, on current earnings, but also sort of what the rest of the year looks like to the degree that companies can can prognosticate about that. But I think there's going to be a lot of disappointment. In fact, if you look at the S&P consensus for the next 12 month uh, earnings per share uh, forward guidance, they're already lowering it. Like, I mean, if you look at a chart, it looks like it fell off a cliff. Meanwhile, the S&P is, is still holding out um, really not that far from uh, all time highs. I mean, we're 10 percent off of all time highs. It's just not a big deal. Um, but so uh, there's going to be, uh, I think a blowout in terms of, uh, price earnings multiples, uh, here in the first to the second quarter. And, uh, that should be really interesting because I think we'll get an opportunity by the year end, um, to put a lot of that cash to work for short-term speculators. Would a good trade simply to be short a lot of these companies going into their reporting of their earnings? You know, I'll tell you, it's it's a tough environment to be short anything. Looking at uh, the Goldman Sachs most short index um, last week, you had one of the most powerful moves in uh, recorded history. So you've you've got major short covering rallies uh, that are being forced unwind for the bears. Uh, if you look at what both uh, high yield and uh, investment grade debt did last week, um, again on the basis of the Fed getting involved in the marketplace. It's really tough to be short individual names uh, because you've you've got the dynamics with the Fed, which are really, really, really dangerous. Do you have a downside target for the Dow or the S&P 500? Uh, about 15,000 on the Dow. 50, so that's what, about 2015 level? What do we be looking at then on the Dow? Uh, if you want to take it back, yeah, that's 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 about right. And, and I think at that point, you have, um, you know, you've given up roughly, roughly 50%. Uh, and you know that's that's not an uncommon uh, marker on the downside. Certainly, nothing as bad as as what we saw uh, in terms of the the, the all in negative effect, both from inflation uh, and a market decline in the 70s. Um, and and certainly it would be modest by comparison to the 1930s. So, um, seeing a 50% decline really in the grand scheme of things is normal. The president, some of his advisors, as well as some economic commentators have said there's nothing wrong with the U.S. economy. We just need to release the people back to work, and then we can continue on with the boom. On the ground level here in Michigan, where I live, and with fellow business owners that I speak with, it's not going to be that easy at all. Uh, what's your feeling about this uh, so-called V recovery that's been spoken about? Yeah, I think V recovery is, is a very low probability. And I think a part of the issue with the U.S. economy to claim that it's really strong is to neglect the fact that we've had to have a trillion dollars in deficit spending uh, in our in the best of times. So if you assume that 2017 and 2018 were in fact the best of times and there's nothing wrong with the economy, then why were we having to goose the system 
with a trillion dollars in money that we didn't have, kind of borrowing from the future to make today look better than it actually was. That's all borrowing is, is basically moving forward consumption from the future into the present. Now, if you feel like that's a good way to do it, um, you know, okay, I guess you, I guess <laughs> that's one, that's one way of looking at the world. But I would say that actually, um, the, the economy is, is not in the best of, uh, conditions uh, because we are so dependent on an increase in credit growth. And and I think ultimately that's that's going to have to be sorted out. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Orn Resources is a junior exploration company with the appetite of a major, focused on finding the next globally significant discovery to create enormous potential upside for shareholders. It's one of the most aggressive exploration companies pursuing high-grade, scalable gold and copper deposits and has a premier seven-project portfolio including its two flagships, Committee Bay in the Arctic and Sombrero in Peru. With Orin's unparalleled technical team and highly experienced management with a history of success in advancing and monetizing exploration assets, Orin has been called one of the best in the junior exploration sector. Orin trades on the TSX and NYSE under the ticker AUG. To learn more, go to orinresources.com. That's A-U-R-Y-N resources.com. With the Dow dropping, uh, I would assume you see deflation all over in terms of real estate asset prices. Um, what's your expectation beyond just the Dow if the Dow does fall to that level? Well, I think this is where um, an investor's got to keep an open mind to both, um, you know, sort of inflation and deflation. Um, something my dad raised me with was the idea of ecospasm, where you know it's like driving up to um, a, a traffic light and it's flashing yellow and red and green all at the same time. Um, for us to be in the context of ecospasm, I think is is going to be more to the point, uh, not really the strong bifurcation between inflation and deflation. There'll be pockets of deflation, pockets where you have you know, sort of asset price implosion, um, but also areas where we see inflation and the effects of not only monetary policy, but also fiscal policy. I think it'd be naive to think that if you put two to five trillion dollars into the markets, again, a combination of fiscal and monetary, uh, that that's not gonna have an inflationary effect somewhere. Maybe not broadly systematic, systematic, but again, that's where the ecospasm idea I think plays plays very well. And how do you think precious metals will perform? They're just they had like seventeen twenty as we speak right now. They bounce back so powerfully from the sell off a month ago. If the Dow continues to crash, do you see gold and the gold stocks being sold for liquidity purposes, or will they remain resilient? Yeah, that's a great question. I do think that you've got. Um, a little bit of uncertainty as it r relates to current earnings. And if we can get uh, the COVID-19 behind us, then we've got a lot of mines that will reopen. But keep in mind, these, these uh, groups that are in the business, they have to sell product. They have to be producing something to be generating revenue. So you could see sort of some nasty surprises um, as, as we come into the second quarter. But again, that all is dependent on how long it takes us to move past the COVID-19. Um, I think in terms of the commodity specific performance, you see gold performing better than your white metals, both the platinum group and silver, because those are more economically sensitive. That, that, that is, you know, when you consider the precious metals as a complete complex, this is where you see the real difference, where gold is the metal for all seasons. It doesn't matter whether it's inflation, deflation, doesn't matter if it's a slowing economy, a thriving economy, it is the metal for all seasons. The other metals are very sensitive with a particular uh, market environment or backdrop. Now, you can argue if you look at silver, it's very inexpensive in, in relation to gold. And if someone has a long enough time horizon, then that's worth playing. Um, but if you're looking at it as a, as a trade, you might be disappointed over the next 30, 60, or 90 days. Um, silver does not have to snap back um, and, and sort of get in line with the gold move. Um, that'll ultimately happen, but yeah, who knows? Maybe that's 9, 12, 18 months out. With gold, it performs well, most gold investors know, in an inflationary situation. But for those that don't know, could you talk about how gold can also perform well in a deflationary situation? Yeah, and you know, Roy Jastrom wrote about this a lot in his book, The Golden Constant, where he looks at the instances where gold held its own 
um, you know, increasing your purchasing power anywhere from 50 percent to 250 percent in the context of deflation. And I guess what we really have to get philosophical about is losing less than someone else. If everyone loses in the context of deflation, a, a system wide deflation, then the winner is the person who loses the least. And that would describe gold in a deflationary environment where you might actually see a decline in price. But relative to whether it's uh, stocks or real estate, uh, you actually do very well. And if you're willing to, quote unquote, spend your gold as cash, you can move into other assets for pennies on the dollar. Um, so that, I think, is, is, is worth considering. Uh, it can be a little bit you know, backward, if you will, thinking about winning simply by losing less. <laughs> um, but in a deflationary environment, that's been the case for gold. On the precious metal side of your business, has it been hard for you to access the physical precious metals? Uh, there's dealers that I've bought from here in Metro Detroit. They charge premiums of up to 75% on silver uh, in the last month. I mean, what is your precious metals business right now like? So, I mean, business over the last month has probably increased between five and 700%. So there's been a lot wow. more traffic coming in. And it's definitely, um, you know, people are buying. Uh, we've had no problems with supplies. Um, and basically, we've just avoided any of the products where uh, the premiums are, are too high. So, for instance, if somebody wants to position in silver, we might position them in 1,000-ounce silver bars today and wait for, you know, the premiums on one-ounce eagles or whatnot to, to come back down. So rather than chase it and pay, 40% more or whatever the premiums may be, um, we recognize that, you know, the mints are not making the product. So you run out of secondary market supply pretty quick. Uh, but as soon as the mints get back online, all that premium paid is going to be wasted dollars. So we'd much rather position people in larger product and, and then reposition them uh, once the premiums have, have slipped away. So, and to be honest, we really don't have a lot of issues with supply in part because we've been doing this for 48, 49 years. So our, our connections, I remember talking to one supplier, he said, look, you bought from us during the slow periods and we'll always have supply for you. So, you know, the long-term sort of staying power in the, in the market does, does put you at the front of the line. What do you think about the U.S. dollar? How will the U.S. dollar emerge from this crisis? We know the BRICS nations have been trying to dethrone the dollar. There's other forces at work in the world that would like to see the dollar fall. You think dollar remains, you know, king of the mountain coming out of this crisis? Yeah, you know, our our friend Ian McAvity used to say that the dollar is the best looking horse in the glue factory, mm -hmm. and that you know rings true for us. You know, where where we see the dollar on sort of a long term permanent decline. Uh, just keep in mind that there is no one to take its place. Uh, there is no other single currency to take its place. It looked as if the euro um, could or would if you rolled the clock back 10, 15, or 20 years, uh, but that's just not how it, it is materialized. So we have the incumbent advantage, um, and as messy as our finances are, everyone else's are equally uh, messy, if not messier. So I, I think actually as, as much as you can be dollar negative in here, um, because you've got the whole world under pressure, um, if it's bad for us, it's three, five, five, ten times worse for anyone else. And the whole world, though, is subsidizing just the, the bailout money that's going out to Americans and American business. The whole world is actually subsidizing this through the, the printing of dollars. I've, I've wondered for over a decade now how long this will occur or how long this will continue to happen. But it, it seems like it's just prolonged and you know, in terms of prognosticating, it seems very difficult to see the, the exact date of the demise of the dollar. Yeah, I think these things can speed up in a hurry in the context of modern monetary theory where we can finance uh, all of our deficits. And, and because uh, we have such a quote unquote strong currency, there won't be any blowback from that. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to watch this week's, um, you've got the TIC data that's coming out from the treasury, which tells you uh, who is buying and selling treasuries. And we know that there's been quite a bit of liquidation uh, in terms of treasury holdings from foreign central banks here in the last uh, 30 to 60 days. And so we'll be watching the TIC flows. I think that's out this Thursday. And, you know, going forward, it's also going to be very interesting just to see yeah, if it's not the rest of the world that has an appetite for dollars, 
then does that mean that it's only the Fed that will maintain an appetite uh, for U.S. debt? I mean, keep in mind, when you promise $2 trillion in fiscal spending and you don't have the money, you're going to have to finance it. Who will be the buyer of this $2 trillion that was just promised uh, to, to the small businesses around the country? Um, and, and if you want to monetize, we've kind of been down that road before. Monetize too much debt, and now all of a sudden you do begin – to have real concerns about the stability of the currency. So those things, although it doesn't seem like a problem today, within a 24-hour period, the mind of the market can shift, and all of a sudden, it, it's a big, big deal. With this last uh, bill passed by Congress, this relief, do you see kind of a fusion of the, the Fed and the Treasury to where the lines of demarcation are not as clear? <laughs> I, just, I think they're getting very good at working together. This is kind of a uh, an unfortunate incestuous relationship, and you know, again, it, we're we're seeing um, uh, circumstances justify a move towards modern monetary theory. Um, what what we have is is just one more euphemism or one more description for what has been you know monetary policies run amok. Um, you know, dozens of times, if not hundreds of times, throughout world history. Um, we're we're looking at radical inflationism and radical inflationism. I think at the end of the day, whether it is uh, Fed and Treasury and and sort of the blurred lines as you describe them, or the Bank of Japan buying equities in the stock market through ETFs, um, this this is a period of time that I think you want to pay attention to uh, gold as an asset preservation as a as a is an insurance policy, uh, as a store of value. Uh, silver is more of a speculation on growth vis-a-vis uh, -vis a move higher in gold, because ultimately it will it will move higher as well. Um, it's a fascinating period of time to, to be in the financial markets. Do you foresee any ability within our lifetime to have a sound financial system? No private central bank running the United States monetary system. I mean, is that is that a possibility or would we have to have an absolute collapse and then a hard reset? Possibly we learn our lesson on the other side of that. Well, for anyone interested, I would encourage you to go to our wealth management website. Uh, the comments from Doug Nolan, my colleague who writes the Credit Bubble Bulletin, dealt with sound money uh, this weekend. And, you know, I think it's it's philosophically something that we should prize. It's something we should defend. It's something that we did not have uh, the guts to to keep in motion. Um, and, and so we have paid a, a high price uh, since the creation of the Federal Reserve, our central bank. We've lost greater than 96% of the value of the dollar. It takes a lot more money to buy the same stuff that it did 100 years ago. And it, do I think that that's going to come back into vogue? I don't think so because we don't have a political will for it. Um, you'd have to have a, a different um, group of people in Washington for it to make sense mm -hmm. because really what they like is carte blanche to spend money that they don't have. This is the, the nature of, of a democracy which is being corrupted through time is being able to take the public purse – and spend it. And then when you run out of that to spend more promise dollars to voters in the process of, of establishing yourself as a lifelong politician, sound money is incompatible with democracy. Um, and so if we return to something more of a of, of, of republic, <laughs> you know, what our founders put in motion, uh, then perhaps – uh, but in the context of a democracy, it's a free for all for who can uh, get as much uh, sort of slop shifted their direction. And that was part of the idea, wasn't it? Albeit imperfect, uh, when the founders made sure that people that could vote own land, wasn't that part of the idea that they had a vested interest in what was going on? Well, that's right. That's right. It's it, it's imperfect in the way it was implemented. And if you looked back, there's certainly room for critique in terms of how it was done and who was not enfranchised. Um, but there's been so many studies showing that we changed considerably after World War II. As we moved towards sort of full enfranchisement, all of a sudden we had a budget uh, which, which was up for grabs. No longer did we care about having a sound budget, uh, a balanced budget. Um, it became kind of a free-for-all for who gets what. And so, yeah, I would say uh, that there is a trade-off, and and we've we've done the right thing for many disenfranchised people, and from an economic standpoint, it's it's set us on a road to perdition. So it, it's it's tough balancing the two. 
uh, ideologically, I like the idea of, of a gold standard. It's one of the reasons why we launched our vaulted program in recent years, uh, where you can save in gold ounces directly with the Royal Canadian Mint, buy and sell very easily, very inexpensively. Um, and I just figure that if, if we're not going to have a system that supports sound money, there's no reason why individuals can't put themselves on a gold standard. And that's something worth considering for your family, um, is, is having your savings denominated in ounces rather than worthless script. And, and I think, again, it's not a real big deal in the U.S. for us to think about the demise of the dollar because, at, frankly, at 1% or 2% or however many percent the inflation rate is per year, we don't really think about it. But imagine if you were in Venezuela or Argentina this last year where you might have lost a third or two-thirds of the first purchasing power or more of, of your hard-earned money. Now, all of a sudden... <laughs> That idea of a gold standard just makes sense, and saving in ounces makes sense. So, mm -hmm. vaulted.com is an e interesting resource if if people are interested in doing for themselves what the system is is not likely to do for them. Mm -hmm. And I pulled it up. It's vaulted app, or is it vaulted.com? Vaulted. Just vaulted.com. Vaulted.com. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Both are both are our our URLs, but vaulted.com is is where we usually direct people. So, David, as we conclude, would some of your advice be going forward for the rest of 2020 be don't buy the Dow and buy gold, or am I too simplistic in saying that? Well, I think pricing liquidity is really key, and having a balance between dollars and gold makes sense um, because I think there's going to be some value opportunities uh, presenting themselves. I mean, again, if you think about what you're paying for in the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ today, uh, we have at least a short period of time, six weeks, where we don't know what these companies are earning. So how do you gauge what they're worth if you don't know what their sales are, if you don't know what their revenues are, and ultimately don't know how that's either going to positively or negatively impact their bottom line? You're speculating on the unknown. You're buying mm -hmm. blind. And, and until COVID-19 is behind us, that's going to be the case. You have no idea what earnings are in the price earnings relationship and ratio. So buying blind, I don't think is a good idea. Let this play out and see if in fact you don't have a significantly better opportunity to put money to work for you down the line. Do I think gold could see a nice rise? Yeah, because actually we know, we know that there's very little gold available um, in the investment markets. And when investors in earnest want to own any, that's when I think you see that su supply elasticity or inelasticity rather um, has a major impact on, on the price um, really, really having it go parabolic. You've been listening to David McIlvaney. He is the CEO of the McIlvaney Financial Group. To learn more about the Vaulted product, go to vaulted.com. And you can also find David's commentary on his weekly podcast, the McIlvaney Weekly Financial Podcast. David, as always, I appreciate your insights, and thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, great to be back with you again.